Welcome to the topic of parallel visualization. Today, I'm going to give an overview of the ideas behind parallel visualization algorithms. So last time we mentioned different strategies for handling large-scale dataset. One of the methods that can be very effective for handling very large data is to use parallel computers. For example, in the Blue Waters machine, we have more than one petabyte total memory that can be used to store a lot of data. Why do you use parallel algorithm for visualization and data processing? The first reason is that you can utilize the aggregate memory from all the nodes to store very large data. And also, you can take advantage of the total compute power so that you can perform a large amount of computation. Most of the parallel computer has efficient parallel file system, so you can open and read or write different segments of the file in parallel that will overcome the data movement bottleneck. And finally, one reason to use parallel machine for visualization is that the data computed from large-scale simulations are stored in supercomputer. Because the large size, it is very difficult to get the data out. So one manageable way to process large data is to run your simulation in the same machine where the data are stored. So there are also situations that you do not want to use parallel computers to perform visualization. As I mentioned just now, one major advantage of parallel computer is its large amount of aggregate memory. And this is useful when the visualization algorithm requires you to process the data in its entirety. That is, you need to touch every element in the data set before you can generate your visualization result. However, if there's no such need, and at any instant you only need to process a small chunk of data, then using parallel machine will not give you much benefit. The other situation that you do not necessarily want to use parallel computer is that if your algorithm requires a lot of communication between the processors, you may not be able to get the speed that you expected because communication among the processors are still considered to be one of the most expensive component in the entire computational pipeline. If your algorithm requires a lot of communication, you will not be able to speed up your computation much. What are the sources of communication? It can be data movement. If you need to pass the data around among the different processors so that you can compute your utilization output, then your problem may be communication bound. Or if you generate a lot of intermediate data, or called derived data, that also require you to communicate it among the processors before a task can be completed, and your problem can be also communication bound. In both situations, you may not be able to take the full advantage of the parallel computers. So if your problem is either communication bound or does not require to process the data in its entirety, what do you do instead? You can design your algorithm in a more effective way, such that you can subset the data or partition the data, and then bringing the data to your machine only when necessary. This is called out of core processing. Out of core processing often is designed for running on single workstation or machines with smaller number of processors. Or you can perform multi-resolution visualization. That is, you can bring down the resolution of data to a reasonable level to the point that the size of data is manageable. Then you can use regular machine to perform the visualization computation. Another strategy that can be used is so-called query-driven visualization. Basically, you partition the data and put into proper data structure, and you design efficient indexing scheme. Based on what the user wants, you quickly identify the data blocks that are relevant and perform visualization only to those data blocks. In this case, you do not need a big supercomputer to run the visualization algorithm. Yet another strategy is to perform streaming data visualization. If you do not need to process the data altogether simultaneously, you can stream the data either from local disk or from remote site and process the task piece by piece. Now let me mention different types of parallelism when you are utilizing supercomputers to run your data processing and the visualization algorithm. One is called data parallelism. This is the most common parallel processing strategy. We are assuming that you need to process your data at its entirety at the same time. Because the total size of data is larger than the size of any processing node's local memory, you are going to partition the data into different small pieces and then give each processing element, or PE, one partition of the data. One characteristic of data parallel is that after each PE receives the data, they are going to run identical tasks. 
Depending on the underlying algorithm, there may or may not be communication required among the processor elements. When each processing element just runs the same task and there's no communication required, this is the best scenario. And you can get a very good speed up by using all the processors. And this is typically called embarrassing peril. This diagram shows that we divide the data into many, many small pieces. And then each processor is going to load the data or acquire the data from a master data node. And once they receive the data, they are going to run the same process to generate the data analysis or visualization result. And after that, in the case of visualization, we need to produce images, and this is called rendering. There might be communication among the processors needed to put the result together into a single image. And this is why you see that among the render boxes, there are arrows indicating communication among the processors. The other type of parallelism is called task parallelism. Instead of dividing the data, we divide the entire problem into a set of small tasks. Typically, they are in particular order. And each of the tasks has a unique role and uh, has its own input and output. So data are passed from tasks to tasks. And uh, you can consider each task perform a special type of transformation to the data. When you break your data into many pieces, then you can start all the tasks in a concurrent way, sometimes form a pipeline. As long as you make every processor busy, you will get a good speed up. Depending on the different types of machine that you are using, you need to run different types of parallelism. One of the common parallelism is called distributed memory parallelism. This is typically the case for most of the supercomputers that have distributed memory architecture. What you need to do when you use this parallelism is you divide the data into small pieces and then you distribute the data into different processing elements. To handle the need of communication, either for producing the intermediate result or putting together the final results and send back to the user, you need to rely on libraries that can perform message passing. One common message passing interface is MPI. For this type of parallelism, if a processing node has multiple core, you can run the task within the processing node in parallel as a multi-core algorithm. And typically, communication within the core in a single processing unit is much faster than communicating messages among different processing nodes. Another type of parallelism is called shared memory parallelism. This is for the machine that supports shared memory architecture when all the processing elements can access the data. Therefore, they have the same view of the data. For this type of parallelism, there's no explicit message passing needed. What you need to do is to design algorithm that can assume all the data are available, and uh, you focus on dividing your task into parallel threads. Libraries such as OpenMP is designed to support such a scenario. And finally, you could have hybrid parallelism. This is when your machine has many processing nodes. Among the processing nodes, they need to rely on messaging passing libraries such as MPI to perform communication. But within each node, you may have a good number of computation cores. And you can run multiple threads in the processing node by running shared memory parallelism. Within the processing node, you use shared memory libraries such as OpenMP, and then when you have to communicate with other processing nodes, then you use messaging passing libraries such as MPI. One example that can run such hybrid parallelism is, say you have a machine with A quad-core processors. Among the processors, you can perform message passing, but within each processor, because you have a quad-core, they perform shared memory parallelism. Now let me give you an example of distributed memory parallelism. This is the model we are going to adopt when you are using machines such as Blue Waters. Given a large-scale dataset, because it's greater than the size of local memory in any of the processing nodes, you're going to have to divide into small pieces. In this example, we divide into A pieces. And then, through some communication mechanism, you give the data to all the participating computer nodes. In the example here, we have four computer nodes. Because you divide the data into A pieces, then you're going to give each compute node two pieces. This is the pipeline. You perform data decomposition, and you distribute it to the available compute nodes. And then, depends on which algorithm you're running. For example, ISO contouring algorithm in this example, 
each processing node is going to run the same algorithm and uh, extract sub result. And to obtain sub result, in the example here, we are going to get portion of the ISO contour from each of the data sub blocks. After all the sub contours are produced, then we send the result back to one particular node. That is, we are going to combine the result and then display the result to the front end user. When you are partitioning the data, there is something you need to pay attention. One thing is called ghost cells. In the example here, we have a 5 by 3 2D mesh. Now assuming we are running an ISO contouring algorithm, as you can see in the example, the ISO contour goes through four of the cells. Assuming you are going to perform data subdivision into two pieces. In the example here, you can give the data within the red rectangle to one processor and uh, give the data in the blue region into another processor. But for the middle column, the yellow portion, you need to duplicate it. That is, you need to make two copies and give the identical copy of the data in this column to both processors. Why do you need to do this? Because both of the processors require the data in the yellow region to perform interpolation. If you give the data element in the yellow region to only one processor but not to the other, the other processor will not be able to perform interpolation because they do not have information on one side of the partition. And this duplicated layer of data is called ghost data or ghost cell. Another example of why you need ghost cell is you can consider when you perform particle advection that we discussed in the topic of flow visualization. Because in order for you to determine the next particle position, you need to move the particle to an intermediate position. In the example here, you need to move the particle from xt to xt plus k1. Now, this xt plus k1 point might fall out of the data that owns by the processor at the upper left corner. In this example, you need to extend the data and provide that to the processor that performed the particle division for this initial position. And this additional data is ghost cells. This will give you enough information to complete one step of particle division and then get the final position of the particle. So now I have already talked about you need to divide the data into pieces and then distribute the data to different processors. But the question now is, how are you going to distribute the data blocks? Who is Which process is going to get which portion of data? For many algorithms, this data distribution stage is critical for the overall performance. A lot of time when you don't distribute the data properly, you're not going to get a complete parallel speed up. Assuming your task, if you run in serial, is going to take Ts amount of time. Now, when you have n processors, the ideal speed up is Ts divided by n. However, because of overhead involved, a lot of time you will not get this ideal speed up. Say the time you're going to use for parallel computation is Tp. Now, the difference between Tp and the Ts divided by n is so-called parallel overhead. You can reduce the parallel overhead if you have a better data distribution scheme. And the overhead is caused by imbalanced distribution of the workload. Some processor will have more work to do than others, then you're not going to be able to get ideal speed up. Or the overhead can come from communication. That is, even though every processor is equally busy, but if they need to frequently stop and then communicate with each other, and the time spent on communication is the parallel overhead. The data distribution scheme you are going to use is to reduce this either low imbalance or communication. So there are different techniques that you can use to perform data distribution. One is the most straightforward contiguous distribution. That is, you divide the entire data domain into several contiguous segments, and then you give one segment to one processor. In the example here, we have four processors, and we divide the data into four contiguous regions, and we give one region to each processor. Another way is to, instead of giving each processor a contiguous region, we first of all divide the data into many small pieces, and then we perform round-robin distribution. That is, you take the first small piece, give to processor 1, second go to processor 2, third give to processor 3, and the fourth piece to give to processor 4, and then you go back to processor 1 and to give the next piece. In order to perform round robin data distribution, you need to subdivide the data into more pieces 
and the number of processors. This typically can give you a more even task distribution. And finally, the last data distribution technique is workload-aware data distribution scheme. In this scheme, you design a special algorithm to estimate the workload that's associated with each data block, and you distribute the data block with a goal to balance the workload, that is, having each processor process an equal amount of work. This type of data distribution scheme requires you to understand your algorithm, so it's often very specific. When you use different data distribution schemes, you are going to change the workload distribution. And uh, based on how the workload are distributed among different processors, your parallel performance will change. Take one example of particle tracing. Because you do not know where the particle is going to go, if you assign a big contiguous region to a processor, a lot of time you may not have any particle force into that contiguous region that will make the process completely idle. In this case, you might want to use round-robin or so-called block cyclic distribution scheme. It is always better to distribute the data block based on the workload associated. And of course, a lot of time it is very difficult to have an accurate estimation. In that case, you may not be able to use workload-aware distribution scheme. Now let me just show you some examples of parallel visualization algorithms. One example is parallel isosurface. Assuming you are running marching cubes, a marching cube is typically considered as an embarrassingly parallel algorithm. This is because there is no communication required. Every processor can just focus on the data assigned to it and perform the same algorithm cell by cell and compute triangle patches from the cells. And this is one example of data parallelism. You need to process the data as its entirety. And because every data block requires the same amount of work, you should divide the data into chunks of equal size. And there is no communication required until you need to return the resulting triangles back to a master node, or you're going to perform parallel renderings of those triangles. So parallel isosurface extraction is a simple case that can be easily parallelized and to get reasonable speed up. Another example is parallel particle tracing. Parallel particle tracing is a little bit more difficult because the workload depends on whether a given data block contains the particle that is required to perform the other action. There are general different strategies. One is so-called parallel by data. In the example on the right, and we divide the data into four chunks, then each processor will hold one chunk of the contiguous region. Assuming we start a particle at the lower left corner, and there was original data is held by P1. So T1 is going to push the particle all the way to the boundary. But beyond the boundary, processor 1 is not going to have the data. So he needs to give the particle to the next processor that holds partition number 2. Then the second processor is going to move the particle all the way to the boundary, and then give the particle to the processor that has the blue data, that is processor 3. So you can see that if you perform parallel by data, if you only have one particle, you will not get any speed up at all. Instead, you're going to be penalized by the communication overhead. This pair by data scheme, however, can benefit if you have a large number of particles. That is, every subregion of the data, you have some particles that you need to advert. This is an effective scheme when you want to utilize the aggregate memory to load the data. Each processor will always keep the data assigned to it and you only need to communicate the particles when the particle you're working on arrive at the boundary and you give to the next processor that has the data in the neighboring data block. Because there's no data movement, and you only need to communicate particle, which is typically of smaller size, and you can get good speed up. The example on the left is so-called parallel by the seeds. Essentially, you do not divide the data. You're assuming every processor has the chance to own the entire data set. In the example here, you have four particles, and you want to compute the particle traces from them simultaneously. What you can do is you can assign each particle to each processor, and the processor is going to be responsible for moving the particle all the way till the end. In this case, wherever the particle goes, the processor needs to have the required data, either by loading the data in the very beginning, but this means you have to replicate the data to all the processors which limits the total size of data that you're able to process. Or you load the data from the disk on the fly, but this will require a lot of I.O. So typically, 
parallel by seeds is going to give you good performance only if you have enough particles to keep everybody busy and the size of data is small enough so that you can preload the data into each processor's local memory. And finally, let me give you an example of parallel bound rendering. So how do we perform rendering in parallel? There are also multiple schemes. One is so-called parallel by pixels. Because remember our one rendering scheme, you need to cast a ray from each pixel into the data space. What you can do is you can divide the image space into different processors. In the example here, I have nine processors. So you divide the data into nine different chunks. And each processor is going to be responsible for casting ray from the pixels within the tile of the image. So assuming each processor has the entire data, there's really no communication required because each processor is going to be responsible for obtaining the color for the pixel that it initiates the ray. And after that, you just need to store the resulting color to the appropriate location representing the pixel. And also, because each processor is going to compute the final image value for the pixel, there's no image compositing needed. So this means there's no sub-pixels that the color need to be blended together, and this is called image compositing, which I will talk about more later. The main issue about parallel per pixel algorithm is that the data often need to be replicated. This is because if the user change the view, a given pixel might require data along arbitrary direction. And instead of communicating data around to satisfy the need of a pixel, people usually copy the entire data to the local memory of the processor. However, when the size of data is large, this is not possible. So this makes it difficult to scale this type of algorithm to handle big data. Another algorithm shows on the right of this image is so-called parallel data. Basically, what we do is to divide the data into small chunks. In the example here, we divide into A chunks. Then we assign the A piece of data to A different processors. After that, we are going to have each processor perform one rendering for the smaller chunks assigned to it. And this will generate A sub-images, one for each data block. After that, we need to perform compositing. That is, we need to blend all the partial images back to the image plane to produce a single final image. So the property of this parallel by data algorithm is that it requires image compositing. And also because partial images need to be blended together, processors need to communicate their result to perform such blending. So more communication is often required. However, the advantage of this is that we do not need to have each processor keep an entire copy of data. Instead, they only need to keep the sub-blocks assigned to it. So this will make it much easier to scale the algorithm to handle much bigger data sets. Okay, this concludes an overview of parallel visualization algorithm and strategy.